spring today. Did you know that? Kind of is almost like, feels, has that feel outside too, doesn't it? I invite you to stand. This is a hymn that uh, I, I don't know, I always, in spring, I always think of this hymn, so I thought I'd pick it for uh, this morning too, so. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's my hands and me. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great mountains and and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Please be seated.
you'll be able to hear me a little better that way. Welcome to each one of you who has come to join us in person, to each one of you who is joining us virtually, to you who are taking advantage of the video later on. We trust that together we will be able to worship our God and receive strengthening for our days. There are quite a number of announcements that I'd like to highlight. We uh, thank you all for your support for our witness workers in South Korea, Baki and Su Kyung. Um, let's continue to pray that God would bless them in their ministry. Today, this afternoon, VBS meetings this afternoon for Winnipeg and Cross Lake. Uh, One o'clock for the Winnipeg meeting and approximately 2.15 for Cross Lake, so looking forward to uh, seeing everyone there. Young adults are uh, having a get-together tonight at 7 at Kennedy's home. A uh, few details there. The um, mums group continue, or, uh, yeah, begins, um, or continues meeting, I should say, on Tuesdays in the morning, and in conjunction with that, uh, they are looking for some volunteers to help out if you are able to come to the church on Tuesdays to help play with the kids and assist in activities so that the mums have some time to chat. Please contact Moses or Kennedy. We would love to set up more of a structure for this group, but need some volunteers to make it happen. Also, the Rooted Bible Study continues on Wednesdays, and for those who are able, they wish to meet in person at the church this Wednesday at 10 in the morning. Crystal also has an announcement that she would like to make. It's really big font, but maybe not big enough. Uh, a few months ago, a pastor from a newcomer congregation, the Source of Life Church, visited us at church. He was wondering if we have space to rent out our church building on Sunday afternoons because their church is losing their meeting space soon. Church Council has spent a few months considering this request while in conversation with this pastor. In general, we like the idea of helping a fellow congregation who is in need. We also like the idea of our church building being used more than it is. That being said, there are also some logistical concerns with Sterling as well as Lighthouse of Hope congregation that meets here on Saturdays. We are continuing the conversation and looking into the details. We will keep you informed and bring the final question to the congregation. We ask you for your continued prayers as we discern the right way forward. And if you have any questions, please contact a member of church council. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. As we continue in worship, I invite you to bow with me. Life-giving God, may your Holy Spirit inspire our praise and our prayers Open our hearts to your presence among us and within us. Come alive in our words and actions as we worship together. To you alone belongs all the praise, honor, and glory and blessing, now and to the end of time. Amen. And before we continue with singing, I will um, extinguish three of the candles as we journey towards the cross on Good Friday.
I'll invite you to stand once again, and before we sing our next song, um, just turn and greet each other, kind of show your welcoming smiles through your eyes. Maybe some fist bumps, something like that. I'm gonna I'll, you, uh, please be seated. It's a bit of a round. Well, it is a round song. It's not a bit of a round song. We're gonna split right down the middle. This half will be number one. That half will be number two. And while we're singing this song, it's a song I've done with the kids in the Sunday school as well. So, if the kids want to come up to the front here and get ready for a children's story, which is gonna be right after this song. We're gonna sing it together first. Um, it's called "Lord Is My Shepherd." It's pretty simple. The Lord is my shepherd, I'll walk with him always. He knows me and he loves me, I'll walk with him always. Always, always, I'll walk with him always. Always, always, I'll walk with him always. Group one. The Lord is my shepherd. Everybody, how are you all? My name is Tanis. Do we have do we have the kids on Zoom that we can see or who do we all have here? Can you tell me your names? What's your name? Kinsley. Kinsley. Robin. Can you tell me your name? This is Robin. Robin. 
Ronan. Ronan. Felix. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> What's your name? Clara. Clara. <laughs> well, we are hoping the kids on Zoom can see us too. I don't know who's all out there, but hopefully they can hear us and see us. Do you ever help your mom or your dad or your grandma? Do you ever help them? Do you help with your baby sister sometimes? Uh huh, I heard that. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We're going to look at some pictures of people and maybe you helping. So let's see if we can see the first picture. Let's see if we can guess what's going on here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Who, does anybody know who that is? That's Harvey. And what's he doing to help? What's he helping with? Does anybody know? Felix, what do you think he's doing? Helping unload the dishwasher. He is helping unload it, for sure. <laughs> unload it and maybe even help clean it. <laughs> okay? Yeah. He's doing a good job. Let's see what else is up there. Oh, there's another helper. What is she doing? Look up there. What is she doing? What's that little helper doing? Anybody know? What's she doing? Feeding her brother. Yeah, she's feeding her brother. Does anybody know her name? I brought papers. Do I have glasses on? <laughs> Thank you. Ava, right? Ava's helping your sister, like you said, Felix, exactly. Okay, let's look at the next one. His, her, her brother, actually. Okay. Let's see what's happening here. Is this a video? Can we play this? Is there any sound? No sound. That's okay. There you go. Okay, so what happened there? What was Ava doing? What was she doing? Was she peeling apples for mom? And what about her brother? He was singing to them. <laughs> right? He was helping sing. That's right. Oh, look at this little one. Do you know who that is? Who's up there? Is that you? Are you, are you baking? What are you baking? Mm, I'm baking pancakes. Pancakes. And did you do that all by yourself? No, my mom helped me. I thought you were helping your mom, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were helping your mom. She didn't have to help you. Looks like you know what you were doing. That's a good helper, for sure. Okay, let's see what else is up there. <gasps> Who's helping here? Who's this? Is this Hayden? Is he helping? He's shopping. Yeah, it looks like he knows what he likes. He likes bananas. Hey? That's your little brother? Oh, he looks like a good helper. He loves to shop for mom, right? Yeah. And I have chubby cheeks. He does have <laughs> chubby cheeks. Yes, he does. That's maybe why he likes to help shopping with groceries, hey? Okay, let's look at the next picture. Uh-oh. Who are those guys? Anybody know? Is that Felix and Arlo? What are you guys baking? What are you making? Cookies. <coughs> Did you bring some to share? <laughs> oh. oh, they look so good. Yum, that's a great way to help your mom and dad. Okay, I think there's another one here. Oh, Ronan, what are you doing? 
you're helping dad build a bookshelf. Bet it looks very sturdy. Good job. You got a good handle on that tool, hey? Right on. Okay, let's see if there's, is there more? Oh, can we get sound on this one too? Who's that? Who's that? Clara, what's going on? Oh, we missed it. Thank you. Look at what was Clara doing? What were you doing? You were cleaning up your stuff so willingly. Well, I think there's one more video. I'm hoping there can be some sound. You might not know this person. This is my nephew's son. So let's see if he was actually helping, okay? We'll try So one we more. unloaded some wood at the other tent, and now he's pulled it all the way almost to this tent. Keep going, Alice. Do you need help? Do you want help, Alice? Oh, good job. <laughs> Ellis, do you want help? No. No? Okay. <laughs> that boy, what was he doing? He didn't want help, did he? He wanted to do it all by himself. And you know what? When I watch all of you help, and Robin, I'm sorry we didn't have a picture of you, but I, I've seen a picture of you helping with your little sister. I did. I know you helped too. And you know what? When I watch all of you and how you hold fast to what is good, I think about how that's how we're supposed to love God how you help, you just want to be in the presence of your mom and your dad and your uncle and your aunt. You just want to do it from your heart. You don't expect any big gifts back. You don't think you should get money at this point. <laughs> you just do it from your heart. You just love being with your mom and being with your dad. You just love clinging to what is good. And that's what I think we're supposed to do with God. We're supposed to just love being with God. Not wanting all kinds of things, not thinking we're earning it and we're the best, but just knowing that God loves us so much and that we just want to be with God and praise him. I really think that's what you were showing me today, this week. So thank you for all your great help. Can we pray together? pray. Thank you, God, for these children who earnestly seek to be in your presence. Thank you for their helping hands. Help them to seek your, your ways in time to come and to know that you will uphold them too. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can go back to your moms and dads. stand remain a mystery to me. I think we're good there. So this morning I'll be reading uh, Luke 13, 1 through 9 uh, from the NRSV. <clears throat> At that very time there was some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? <clears throat> no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, 
and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for the three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. No, Ryan, Ed and I had a good thing going on here with this microphone stand. Or it's not your fault. No. <laughs> Thanks for reading, Ryan. Um, I'm just going to get this adjusted here. I'm going to leave my mask on if it's all the same. I did not shave, and I have a very disgusting mustache right now, so none of you want to see that. Um, well, it's... Uh, it's always a privilege to be uh, invited to speak in front of a, a, I wrote down a group of people, but I, you know, you guys are family. Uh, we worship together. Um, yeah, so people that we love that are seeking to learn uh, more about God um, and worship him um, truthfully and honestly. Uh, it's, a, it's a very humbling experience for me every time um, I'm allowed to do this. And I often go into preparations with an idea in mind, and you know, usually I come away with something very different. Uh, that's, that's the thing about, uh, about Scripture. Um, it's very powerful, and I think it speaks for itself, and we often just have to take the time to listen and to hear what it's, what it's trying to say to us. But even with that as my intention, I will, of course, get it wrong, or if not wrong, incomplete. And that's why I rely on all of you as the community of believers um, to help me challenge and correct and debate and discern and prayerfully wade through this together. So where have we been so far in Lent? This is the third Sunday of Lent. And uh, the theme that we've kind of been going on has had this sense of movement. Um, the first week was from security to generosity. And then we moved uh, to week two from fear to compassion. And then this week, uh, the sermon title that I was given is from earning to receiving. And to be honest, that's not exactly what I got from the scripture text, at least, at least not at first. And I'll go on a bit of a, a rant here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you guys. Um, I don't particularly like when all these you know, sermon series are super neat and tidy and have these perfectly themed titles because I find it's just not reflective of what the Bible actually is. You know, It's messy. It's not so easy to wrangle or to nail down exactly what's happening. You know, it was written over thousands of years by many different people uh, in many different styles. And uh, we get it as this one book in English, but it's actually written across different languages um, that are very different from our own. That's not to say what, uh, what we have as a, as a series and what these titles aren't of value. But I just wanted to put that out there. It's something that I think about all the time. And I often lead a sermon off with something like this, just to remind myself and to remind all of you. So as another reminder, there's going to be discussion time after the service. So if I say something, you can all yell at me or, uh, you know, um, disagree with me there. And I invite you all to do that. And I would love that. Um, I know Moses said he's going to have some tough questions for me. I think he promised that. Kennedy t will, will as well, I think. You know, she's already writing stuff down. I can see it. <laughs> or she's texting somebody. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Kennedy. <laughs> it's notes. It's notes. Okay. Um, so as a bit of an outline for today, we're going to start off um, with the parable of the barren fig tree. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit about repentance and grace. And then just um, the last section I've titled, um, Answering the Dinner Bell. And we'll get more to that. I'll leave that for now. But uh, we're going to go through a bunch of texts 
and uh, hopefully we get something out of it. And um, yeah, I'll do my best um, to keep it concise and hopefully keep it interesting. So I'm just going to read again. Um, I'm going to skip over the first part of, of Luke 13, you know, uh, where the Galileans were murdered by Pilate and where the, the, tower, the tower of Siloam fell on 18 people. Um, the initial thought was just pretty plain, you know, repent or perish. We'll get back to that. It didn't make a lot of sense to me at first what exactly was meant, but by the end of my time looking into this, it, it kind of tied in a bit better. So we'll leave it, leave it for now, and we'll start with uh, chapter 13, verse 6. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then it should bear fruit next year. And then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So this was the thing that kind of kept me awake at night, this parable. I was, what is exactly is going on here? And I'm going to let you into to some of the back-end resources that we were given as, as speakers and worship leaders for this season. And here's the... Each week has a bit of a, a paragraph on a sermon starter, kind of a jumping off point if you need something. Uh, I'll read it for you, and then I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit. This is what it was for this week. Like the gardener in the Luke 13 parable, Jesus doesn't give up on us. He continues to nurture us like a fig tree. The tree does not earn this loving care. It is not bearing fruit. Christ's living water and cultivation are freely given to us. We couldn't afford to buy this true nourishment if it had a price tag. It is difficult for us to accept this grace or even imagine it. Truly, God's ways are as far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. We can be skeptical about gifts that appear to be free but come with an actual cost. God's way contrasts with our culture, which urges us to be self-sufficient and earn our way, basing our identity on the way we make money. Repentance, turning around, includes coming to Christ to freely receive what we can never earn. And that sounds pretty nice. Um, you know, that's pretty neat and tidy. Um, so, of course, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> no, it's not that it, uh, I don't like it. But I don't think the parable is necessarily about God's patience and care for us. I don't think that's the point that was, um, that was meant at the time for the original hearers. I'm not going to say that it doesn't have elements of that. But let's look at this a little bit. I'm going to share with how I interpret it, how many people have as well over the years. Um, and so here's how I would understand it. Um, so the fig tree is the nation of Israel. The vineyard owner is God, and the vine dresser is Jesus. Now, the fig tree is a well-known symbol uh, in the Old Testament for Israel or Judah. Um, passages such as Jeremiah 8, um, and 20, uh, uh, Jeremiah 8, 13, 24, 1 to 10, Hosea 9, 10, Micah 7, 1, uh, all illustrate some of these occurrences. But I'll note here that it doesn't necessarily have to be that. As the most common fruit tree in Palestine, if you're going to talk about fruitfulness or fruitlessness, that's probably what you were going to use. Everybody knew about the fig tree. They were everywhere. So it was a very common uh, metaphor to use. I do, however, think that it fits thematically with the, the program of Jesus' ministry. Uh, but more on that in a, in a little bit. So the vineyard owner, in one translation I had, it said he came again and again, implying this extra special attention. This wasn't just the cursory, you know, one year, let's look through the vineyard, you know, and uh, let's notice a few things. He kept coming back to this tree, expecting there to be something. And eventually he gets exasperated, and there's nothing, there's no fruit on it. He says, cut it down. It is wasting space. But the vine dresser, which represents Jesus, says, no, let's, let's, wait a little bit longer. I'm going to do some work here. I'm going to do some things and see what happens. If it, if it doesn't work out, fine, we'll cut it down. Now, I don't want to read too much into the particulars of this, because uh, I don't think 
Jesus and God are in, a, in disagreement over this. I don't think they're butting heads over what should happen. I think that's besides the point. And parables often had one specific point they were going to make. And so it's dangerous to really dive into them and start pulling stuff out that's not there. But if we move, if we move forward in Luke, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test your memory back from last week, uh, Moses read this passage. Passage. It's in the same chapter, chapter 13, um, starting at verse 31. Uh, actually, no, we're going to start at verse 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is Jesus speaking, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We can see in that passage both Jesus' love for Israel, uh, represented by Jerusalem, but that uh, the love was not reciprocated. It wasn't returned in the proper way. And the time has ended for that nation in a way. And so that's, that's a bit of a tough pill to swallow, I think, especially when we want everybody to be happy. We want things to be all well and good. You know, the first focus of Jesus' ministry uh, was to bring Israel back to repentance. That is absolutely what the purpose was, at least at the beginning. And I think about the Syrophoenician woman that asked Jesus to heal uh, her daughter, who had a demon. And, and Jesus says, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, but he says, it's not right to take the food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Some rough language there, to be sure. But by children, he meant Israel, the Jewish people, and dogs, he meant the Greeks and the Gentiles. And uh, her answer was true, but even the dogs get the scraps from the table. And Jesus was amazed at her answer and, and healed her daughter. And it's not so much the point of that Jesus healed her daughter, but that he himself said, you know, his mission was first to the Jewish people. Ultimately, though, they reject him. We know the story. They reject him. They attribute his miracles, his message to Satan. And... Uh, and God pours his message and his spirit out to the rest of the world. Now, I want to be really, really clear, because I feel some uh, anti-Semitism rising up here, potentially, that the Jewish nation rejected Jesus in a corporate sense. The religious leaders of the people, as a ruling body, rejected Jesus. They built walls, their traditions, around the laws that God gave, and eventually started worshiping those traditions more than the laws that uh, expressed God's true heart for the people, for human beings. Individually, many Jews, even some Pharisees, many of the leaders, well, maybe not many, but definitely some, came to belief in Jesus as Messiah. They formed the early church. They spread the gospel Many were martyred for their belief in the resurrected Jesus. So don't think that the rejection of Israel as a nation is confused with Jewish people as a race or as people. They are, everyone is welcome to, to God's table. And so this kind of leads me into how this passage can also be interpreted on the personal level, closer to what I read from the, the sermon starter. So that's the other way of seeing this. We are the fig tree, and Jesus continues to cultivate us. And sometimes that means digging up the soil around us, and that can be painful. Jesus is patient with us. God is pac patient with us. But we should not be presumptuous about his patience. In, in the parable, the implication is that the patience has run out. And by reading the rest of the story, we find out that is truly the case. But 
just like Israel, we too can turn to worshiping the world. We can turn to worshiping our traditions and elevating those things that don't get to the heart of God over what does get to the heart of God. And so that's where the first few verses of chapter 13 make a little more sense to me. The response is to be one of repentance. Otherwise, like the people that were killed, we too will perish. Not necessarily in that way, but, but Jesus words it very plainly. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so what is repentance? It's a lot more than just expressing sorrow for the evil that we have done. Many people have done that in a secular, in a worldly way, and it has not led to life. It has not led to God's grace. True repentance means turning away or turning around and walking in the proper direction. Now, it doesn't matter what part of the path you are on, and that's the beautiful part. I can illustrate it in this way. I'm going to take this off here. So, if this tree represents God, I would say it's better to be over here and have turned around to face God and start walking in this direction than to be right next to the tree but have your back turned to God. Some of us myself included, have grown up surrounded by the church and by Christian parents and by uh, good influences. And it can be easy to make the assumption that we are this close to God. And that alone is enough to save us. But if our back is turned and we are looking in the wrong direction, we won't be able to get to his grace. Whereas some people might find themselves far from God, but they've taken that one step to turn around, and now the light of God's grace is shining on them, and they can begin walking forward. So true repentance leads to an acceptance of God's grace, and accepting God's grace leads to continued acts of repentance. They cannot be divorced from one another without becoming entirely useless. One cannot cling to God while holding tight to sin. Murray G. Brent, in his book, Growing Up in Grace, puts it this way. What's involved in the kind of repentance for which we never need have regret is a change of mindset accompanied by a lifelong moral and spiritual turnaround. Real repentance involves turning from sin and turning to God. We must repent believingly and believe repentantly. I really like that line, I'll say it again. We must repent believingly and believe repentantly. Second Corinthians 7.10 puts it this way. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. If we back up a couple verses from verse 10 to verse 8, uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians here, and he says this, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. Another translation says uh, it, it, it hurt them, and it, he was sad that he hurt them, but then he found, realized that that pain led them to repentance. And so he wasn't afraid to pull any punches if that was to lead them to the repentance that led to grace. Now, I was scrolling through Facebook one day, recently, this, uh, this week, and my dad had posted something, uh, reposted a quote. 
and uh, Rhiannon and I read it. We, we thought it applied pretty well to, to what, what, what I was talking about today. Uh, it's from Sinclair Ferguson. He says this, It is misleading to say that God accepts us the way we are. Rather, he accepts us despite the way we are. He receives us only in Christ and for Christ's sake. Nor does he mean to leave us the way he found us, but to transform us into the likeness of his son. So true repentance uh, leads to transformation. And that transformation is very specific. It's not just being a better man or woman. It's turning into the likeness of Christ. And in order to do that, we need to know who Christ is. Now, Paul didn't enjoy the tough love he had to dispense to the Corinthians, but it led to something life-giving. A.W. Tozer has a book called uh, Knowledge of the Holy, and it's about the attributes of God. And attributes are different than characteristics. Character can be developed. Attributes are something that you have. And God does not develop his character because he doesn't move from something lesser to something more. He is wholly, uh, wholly perfect um, from eternity. And he says this about God's grace. God will always be himself, and grace is an attribute of his holy being. He can no more hide his grace than the sun can hide its brightness. Men may flee from the sunlight to dark and musty caves of the earth, but they cannot put out the sun. So men may in, disp in any dispensation despise the grace of God, but they cannot extinguish it, extinguish it. And that's where I think it finally came around to me. Maybe I was too harsh with my rant at the beginning. You know, we do go from earning, trying, and, and toiling to receiving God's grace. And I, I, I really struggled with this sermon which led me to struggle with why I was struggling with this sermon. Was I not getting it right? What am I missing? Who am I to stand up here today and speak about repentance, repentance and grace? Am I being faithful to the heart of God? The truth is, I'm not sure. I'd never got answers to these questions. But I'm here, and I'm, uh, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit with my words. And I'm trusting all of you with my words as well, that we can work together. Not to, not to shape something in our own image, but to uncover, to dig deeper as to what the truth is. I have a couple other passages that I want to use to try and tie this together. The first one is found in Acts. And I'll give a bit of a backstory because I don't like scripture that's taken out of context. And so I think this fits well because uh, Luke and Acts are usually seen as one long book that we've split into the Gospel of Luke and then the book of Acts. And the Gospel of Luke obviously focuses on uh, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. Acts focuses on the early church. So it's a natural split, but they were written as one book. The author is traditionally presumed to be Luke. Um, so it ties well together with Luke 13, what we're reading here. It's kind of the end result of the parable of the barren fig tree. And so Peter and John are going up to the temple to worship, and they see this lame beggar, he comes, asks them for money, and they say, we have no money, you know, we can't help you there, but we can give you something else, you know, why don't you pick up your mat and walk, walk now, <laughs> he's like, okay, that's fine, I'll take that, um, and, uh, and the people find, find this lame beggar clinging to Peter uh, and John, because he's very thankful that he's now able to walk. And Peter sees his opportunity to start preaching, which is great, you know. And he's preaching to probably uh, Jews at the temple. So they know the events. Um, so I'll start reading at uh, Acts 3.17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. 
uh, referring to putting Jesus to death. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And I really was struck by that word refreshing and refreshment. And it led me back to another of the scripture passages. And uh, Moses and I had a discussion. We were both preaching on the same stuff this morning. Uh, he was preaching on, on Zoom, I'm guessing, to a, a church in Ottawa. And uh, so we had a, I don't know, half hour, 45 minute conversation about where we were going with this. And I was focusing on the fig tree. Moses wasn't really interested in that, and he was focusing on Isaiah 55. I wasn't really interested in that, but after that conversation, I kind of came back to it, and then I saw this word, and it brought me back to this. So I'll end uh, with Isaiah 55, um, 1 to 9. So bear, bear with me while I read this. Um, and then I have one last thought, and then we'll close. Isaiah 55, 1 to 9. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that you did not know, you, sh you shall run to that did not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And that imagery of coming to a feast has stuck with me all week as I've reflected on this. So where are you standing today? This isn't an altar call, but a dinner bell. An invitation that is not earned, but freely given to join the great feast of the Lord's goodness. To do so, we must give up the moldy scraps that we have been hoarding and greedily devouring in the shadows. We need to step into the light of God's grace. The choice is clear when we are given the proper perspective, but we are really comfortable in our sin. And that's where it gets tough. So as we move throughout Lent, let us remember to repent and rip ourselves away from sin daily. And not leave it at that, but turn and enjoy the Lord's table and his feast that he has graciously set out for us. Thank you, Jordan. Let's respond together, uh, singing how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son. To make a wretch's blood treasure, 
How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring all of us to glory Behold a man upon a cross my guilt upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was a cause dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything no gifts no powers no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Amen to uh, share a little bit about what's going on in each other's lives. Uh, as um, Byron comes up, I invite you to stand if you are able and hear the benediction. And of course, uh, following the final song, uh, we can take about 10 minutes or so to um, catch up a little bit and then invite you uh, back for some discussion if you would like to do that. Go forth in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the God who fills the hungry with good things fill us all with Christ-like love and with a consuming hunger for justice in our land and in our world. Amen. is over you will never slumber nor sleep he who watches over you will never slumber nor sleep oh my child lay your burdens down lay them out slumber no sleep he who watches over you will never 
slumbered or sleep He who watches over you Will never slumber nor sleep Oh, my child, lay your burden down Lay them at my feet He who watches over you Will never slumber slumber nor sleep he who watches over you will never slumber nor sleep amen go in peace